the atmosphere and do not forget to spend the rest of the weekend later on to see more part of Bali. We will now resume the meeting. I open this morning focus session. Good morning. Welcome to the focus session, Principles of Internet Governance. The themes of this morning session is, of course, central to the whole idea of IGF. For the next 90 minutes, I hope what we will make progress in these important topics. Our moderators and panelists will get us through three tasks and help us understand the progress made. We will hear an overview of the key projects on internet governance principles that have been developed and adopted by previous governmental and non-governmental groups over the past few years. We will discuss various similarities, overlapping proposals, and areas of consensus, and also differences and disagreements with regard to these various principles. And we will discuss how to move forward towards a common multi-stakeholders framework of communication or principle for internet governance policy making based on the existing initiatives and project. Our expert will get us, and I hope all you participants will contribute your ideas and advice. Now, allow me to introduce moderators, and I will turn the sessions later on to them. I would like to introduce our two moderators, Wolfgang Klens Watcher, on my right side, from University of Aarons, and Miss Elise Manua. Okay, excuse me if I pronounce it incorrectly. And Chair of the Internet Governance Forum Kenya, from Kenya. We also have a remote moderator, Paul Fehlingers. I think he is over there, who will introduce comments and questions from our remote participants. And rapporteurs, Afri Doria, is he here? Afri? Oh, great, wonderful. Who will offer a summary of our discussions? Wolfgang, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And welcome and good morning to everybody. I think this session is the result of a debate which uh, goes on for years now. And if I remember correctly, already in the very first IGF, we had, in essence, in 2006, we had discussions about Internet governance principles. What we have seen over the years is that more and more institutions, organizations, networks decided, you know, to draft a set of principles for the governance of the Internet. And when we made a recount on the last IGF in Baku, we ended up with more than 25 or even more documents, declarations, resolutions, statements, which defined principles for Internet governance. Um, this is wonderful on the one hand because we have reference documents and guidelines which help us to understand better you know, uh, the framework in which we operate when we are uh, develop and using the internet. On the other hand, this is also confusing because, you know, it's, it's an invitation to principle shopping. So that means everybody takes just the principle he or he likes. And so this is not a situation which is very useful. We have one world, we have one internet, and so the discussion which kickst was kickstarted in Baku was should we move towards one set of internet governance principles? If you go through the 25 plus projects, then you see all the wonderful individual declarations are uh, either one stakeholder declaration, so are adopted by governments or by the private sector or by civil society, very often in consultation with other stakeholders, but the formal procedure for the adoption of the document is a one-stakeholder thing, or they are regional limited. 
The Council of Europe is a member organization of 48 members. It's a strong organization, it's governmental, but it's just 48 states. We have 193 member states in the United Nations. So the idea which was discussed then in the uh, Paris um, uh, meeting, the WISIS 10 plus meeting related to the MAC meeting was, uh, could we try to globalize these principles and to multi-stakeholderize the principles. That means to go beyond the 25 plus and to find ways where we have something in common because if you go through all the 25 projects, then you see that 80% probably uh, come up with very similar principles. You have some principles which are rather different. So OECD is more business oriented, Council of Europe is more human rights oriented. And then you have certainly some controversies where you have differences. So, and in the preparation of this uh, Bali meeting, you know, the, the group which was formed to prepare this focus session said, okay, should we select from the 25 um, um, uh, projects eight, four from the governmental groups and four from the non-governmental groups so that they can present their documents here and their ideas behind the principles, and then to discuss where to go from here, whether we could go one step forward, as the chairman has said, you know, this is a forward-looking session, and to start a process where we could, the principles, um, those principles could be globalized and multi-stakeholderized. So this is new territory. So the IGF does not provide a framework how to draft a document. So uh, we have to invent a procedure. But the Internet was always about innovation, invention. So we had a lot of technical invention. We are still weak with policy inventions. So we have invented some new mechanisms, but you know, this is not the end of the story. We need more creativity. We need more innovation also in policy making, even in public policy making. And so this is a, let's say, a test uh, and uh, whether we are able to kickstart a process where the various sponsors of these projects, you know, enter into a dialogue with the aim, uh, I would not say to harmonize the principles, but as I said, to globalize and to multi-stakeholderize the principles and to find a way, is there a common ground? Very high level, non-binding, very general. The, we have compared this in the discussions since the Paris meeting quite often with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from 1948. Um, uh, I have studied the background from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and it's interesting to remember that human rights discussions went on for years and years and years and only after World War II with the big shock of massive violation of human rights, the international community concluded we have to do something. And a lot of governments wanted to have a legally binding document and say, you know, we have to have a treaty for human rights. And Eleanor Roosevelt, who chaired the third committee in the General Assembly of the United Nations, argued, okay, if we start immediately into uh, treaty negotiations, it will take us 20 years. So why not just to agree on where we can agree? Not to go into the details, but just to agree there should be no torture. There should be freedom of expression. There should be freedom to travel. There should be the right to education. So, and so the outcome was, you know, within one or two years, they were able to produce this very general, non-binding document, which is known now as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it took 20 more years until they had a legally binding treaty. And I think this is an interesting model, that if we move towards a Universal Declaration for Internet Governance Principles, which has to be based on the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, so, um, whether this could be done in a similar way, high level, non-binding, very general, Internet should be free, Internet should be open, should be multi-stakeholder, end-to-end, secure, you know, all this what we have in a lot of these principles. So this is a little bit the framework in which we operate and I'm very happy that um, we have representatives from four governmental groups and four non-governmental groups. I'm still waiting for our friend from Brazil 
um, but um, all the others are meanwhile on the table. So, and I would hand over also to, um, to my co-moderator, to Alice, and uh, Alice now will uh, invite the uh, um, various sponsors of the various projects just to give us a, a, a very brief background and overview about their project and their um, uh, main principles. Alice. Uh, thank you very much, Wolfgang. Uh, it's, it's very good to be here. And uh, the discussion on uh, Internet governance principles has actually been an important one. Uh, and I, for one, coming from the Africa region, I don't think we've actually started discussing this in detail or even trying to um, uh, really apply to our day-to-day -day situation and to our challenges. So I think for me, um, what I'd really like to, I would li like to understand what it's about. I'd like to understand, uh, you know, what what they are, uh, and to get a better uh, perspective uh, on on the principles and how you know we can globalize them, uh, and as Wolfgang says, multi-stakeholder them so that they are relevant uh, to, especially for for, the, for those of us who are still struggling to get the internet to um, to people who still. Uh, don't, don't have access. Anyway, i um, very pleased to be introducing a very distinguished panel. Um, uh, and I think we could, uh, we could start off uh, with, uh, with the European Commission coming, who can uh, make the first presentation. Thank you. You have the floor. Yeah. OECD, sorry. Yeah, thank you. You have the floor. Yeah. We have most of the... Um, European member states. That's probably why the OECD is sitting like that, but they are not the only ones. Thank you very much, Alice. Um, we have um, our council has adopted in December 2011. Thank you. Our council has adopted in December 2011 principles for internet policy making. And the purpose for these uh, principles were if I could say, threefold. First of all, um, it is the reflection of three decades of OECD policy in ICT and Internet policy making. Second, it represents a consensus among governments, business, the Internet technical community, and civil society. It is a framework for internet policies, and this is important, to serve economic and social development. I could say that it's the OECD experience that the key to unleashing innovation, creativity, and economic growth lies with an open internet, and that innovation has flourished on the internet without the need for international regulations or treaties. Our consensus reflects the fact that multi-stakeholder processes have been shown to provide the flexibility and the scalability required to access, to address internet policy challenges. None of us owns the internet. It's only by coming together in an open environment that we do all get the full benefits. And in terms of um, source of growth, the Internet is a source of growth and has proven resilient during the economic crisis. It's a core component of the entire economy. And the OECD brings to its members and beyond its experience, its economics, and its evidence-based um, approach to the issues to develop policies and stimulate the Internet economy. Now, the principles are 14. It's a long list, but there are three which are, let's say, the key among those key principles, and these are openness, flexibility, and multi-stakeholder approach. I would like to add before I close that the Council recommendation recognizes two important points. The first one is the strength and dynamism of the Internet, depend on its ease of access through high-speed networks, depends on openness, and depends on user confidence. And second recognition in the Council recommendation is the Internet allows people to give voice to their democratic aspirations 
and any policy making associated with it must promote openness and be grounded in respect for human rights and the rule of law. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, OECD. Uh, I'd like to invite Igor, uh, the advisor to uh, the Russian advisor to the ICT minister. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so, um, since we are talking about internet governance, um, I would like to, to express that Russia uh, and the Russian government supports uh, uh, the general principles of internet governance um, created by OECD, um, by Council of Europe, uh, and other fora, and um, uh, what, um, what was our contributions on uh, different um, forests and organizations uh, was the idea uh, that internet governance will define, have the definition uh, and uh, multi stakeholder model uh, which is um, right and the only approach uh, should be elaborated. Uh, the role and responsibility of all parties uh, and my, mm, main stakeholders uh, should be defined in more details. Uh, uh, and uh, first of all, the, the uh, governments. Uh, the microphone, please. Okay. And, uh, and the governments uh, um, uh, since they, they play the uh, common role uh, regulating the uh, crucial um, areas of economy, uh, like issues of security and stability, uh, uh, critical uh, infrastructure. Um, uh, prevention, detection, and uh, suppression of unlawful acts in the Internet, uh, which means Internet security. Uh, I believe it should be considered in, based on the leading role of national governments and relevant uh, international and inter intergovernmental organizations. Uh, these issues cannot be the exclusive jurisdiction of the private sector and civil society as, on the one hand, don't meet the objectives of profit and focus on on the non-profit goal of protecting the public good. And uh, on the other hand, uh, it's planned to, to implement the functions of compulsions to law. Uh, and the, the goal, of, goal of Internet governance uh, is to create shared policies and standards that maintain the Internet's global interoperability for the public good, uh, ensuring the stability, security, and continuity of the Internet. However, however uh, we have lack of specificity of these terms and principles, and the possible 
differences in the interpretation uh, could be cause the, the not reaching the objectives. Um, I think internal governance is a, a complex system and we could treat it as a, as a, as a product, as a technical product. So it needs to be designed properly and uh, I fully support the idea of uh, creation, the framework but at the same time, we, we, could, we should focus on the certain area like cyber crime prevention, like personal data protection and privacy. So, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I'd like, uh, uh, now like to invite the Council of Europe, Lee Hibbert, please. Thank you, Alice, and hello, everybody. Um, so I work for the Council of Europe, uh, an internal governmental organization um, in Strasbourg, which is based on three core pillars, human rights, uh, the rule of law, and democracy. It has 47 uh, member states, and those states include countries like the Russian Federation, as, as Mr. Milicheski has said, the United Kingdom, Turkey, for example, and many others. Um, since the Council of Europe has been working in the field of internet governance back from the WISIS days. We've had this feeling that there's a need to maximize the people's rights and minimize their restrictions, uh, that, that, that the internet should be a sustainable, people-centered internet. And uh, that led us, apart from many other documents and standards and normative documents being produced, that led us to, in 2010 and 11 to set up a, if you like, a a, 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 a group of experts, government experts and independent experts, including Wolfgang Kleinbechter and, and Bertrand de la Chapelle and others, to come together to discuss uh, the framing of internet, the internet governance principles. And in 2011, uh, the 47 governments uh, adopted a set of internet governance principles, um, 10, 10 principles, and I'll mention them in, in, very shortly. But what I want to say, why are those principles important, is because it helps uh, the member states, it helps, it helps us in our work to frame our understanding of things like internet freedom, cross-border flow of internet traffic, and all the emerging issues that, you, that we're discussing now here in the IGF. It helps us make sense, it helps us to frame it and, and contextualize it in a way. And so, if you like, it provides the house uh, for, for internet governance discussions in, in the Council of Europe. Uh, it, it's it's a, a big part of the, the strategy we, that was adopted by, by the member states in 2012 to 2015, uh, and if you like, it's the, it's the frame for this, and that's, that's very important to give a, a contextual a contextualization of what we do uh, for human rights, rule of law, and democracy. Um, those ten principles, I'll be very quick. Uh, number one, human rights, democracy, rule of law as the number one principle to, to, to respect and maintain. Two, multi-stakeholder governance arrangements making sure that there is equal and full participation of all stakeholders, very, very important. Three, that states refrain from doing harm to the internet across borders. Four, empowering users, and we, that's led us to do a work on a draft guide on human rights for internet users, which we'll discuss at the end of this week. Uh, five, universal access and unimpeded uh, flow of traffic, very, very important. Um, six, something like cybersecurity, security stability and robustness of the internet for uh, an internet which is ongoing in, and has integrity. Seven, decentralization of the day-to-day -day management. We all know what that means, uh, which, is, which includes accountability and, tra accountability and transparency, which is buzzwords of, of the day now. Uh, eight, open standards. Nine, an open network to allow for the greatest possible choice of access, content, and services. And 10, cultural and linguistic diversity. I'm very proud of those principles. Uh, they, they're as valid as they want. They, they were as valid in 2011 as they are in 2012 and 13, and I'm sure until for a few more years to come. Uh, I hope I, I, when I look 
at the other principles which exist, the ones that you are mentioning and others, I find a lot of those principles already in those texts, and I find this a very strong core text of principles to, to move forward with uh, uh, as, as in, in, in terms of a framework of commitments, which Wolfgang has mentioned. It's part of our own mandate of the Council of Europe as part of the Internet Governance Strategy. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, thank you, Lee. And unfortunately, you know, Mr. Fonseca, um, uh, Benedicto from Brazil is not here. Um, so, you know, probably everybody knows that the Brazilians have started also their own set of principles, ten principles uh, drafted by the CGIBR, which are now uh, transformed into a law, the Marco Civil, under Brazilian legislation. So I think this is an important uh, national in initiative for principles, which have also an international dimension, in particular with regard to the forthcoming uh, Internet Summit in Brazil. So, but um, so if somebody from Brazil is in the room and wants to make a statement later, so it's more than, than welcome. Uh, fortunately, we have um, somebody here from the British Foreign Office, um, David, who was in Seoul, uh, because uh, last weekend in Seoul there was another uh, internet uh, uh, conference uh, where a set of principles was drafted. This was initiated by the British Foreign Minister William Hague two years ago in London, the so-called London process. And probably, David, you could give us a very brief uh, information about, you know, what is the set of principles you are moving forward within the so-called London process. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Dan Wiles. I'm from the UK Foreign Office, uh, the International Cyber Policy Unit. Unfortunately, I wasn't in, uh, in Seoul, um, and the team that was in Seoul claimed to be so jet-lagged they haven't yet produced a formal record uh, for me to refer to. So, so anyone who was in Seoul may want to correct me, but I'm happy to try and um, address the, the sort of main outcomes that we see of the, the Seoul uh, Conference on Cyberspace. As the British Foreign Secretary said in his um, speech in Seoul, uh, we have taken strides towards agreeing principles that can form the basis of widely accepted norms for behaviour in cyberspace. Nevertheless, we have still not reached agreement on international rules of the road or set of standards of behaviour. So I think he was sort of saying that, you know, we've come quite far, but there's still work to be done, as we're all gathered here uh, today, we can see. Um, the chairman of the Seoul conference, in summing up, also added that uh, differences of emphasis remain on how we reconcile and accommodate differing national legal practices, uh, uh, policies and processes. He also talked about building on a document that is one of the outputs from Seoul, which is the Seoul framework for and commitment to open and secure cyberspace. So this, this was the document in Seoul which tried to pull together uh, many of the principles that have already been discussed this morning from the OECD, from the uh, Council of Europe, into one document, um, whereby I, th I, th I think we, we see the Seoul conference and its preceding conferences on cyberspace as a, uh, a contribution to what Wolfgang described as the globalization um, of, of, these, of these principles, really, because when these principles have been adopted in different international fora, the membership may, may differ across those fora. So having uh, the 87 countries that were in Seoul kind of sign up to this Seoul framework, we think is, uh, is very important. Um, should also mention that the UK, uh, at the Seoul conference, um, shared a document which we called Next Steps, where we try to sort of summarize the steps that the international community is expecting to take over the coming months in various areas of uh, cyberspace, economic growth and social development, cybersecurity, etc. Uh, that next steps document actually talked about the work of the IGF and, and this group um, to try and pull together the, uh, the principles. So uh, I think that goes to show how much we kind of uh, the UK value, value the work that's being carried out here. It also referred to things like the Commonwealth Cyberspace Policy Framework uh, adopted uh, in Abuja uh, this month. Um, and it also talked about uh, uh, the work of the Human Rights Council 
uh, that has happened so far, but the need to embed further uh, human rights principles into national laws and, and policies. Thank you very much. So that means we heard now from four governmental institutions and networks, you know, what the governments are doing, but at the same time also non-governmental actors, very important in the multi-stakeholder model, have drafted the principles. So already in the, uh, I think the second IGF, the dynamic coalition of the IGF on rights and principles was established, and uh, they have worked on a document which uh, is now also ready and um, uh, Tabani Tavainen from Finland, he is a member of this group, will give us a short uh, overview about the, this document. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I am indeed Tapani Tavainen from Electronic Frontier Finland, as it happens, but now I present the dynamic coalition of Internet Rights and Principles and trying to talk a little about our document, the Charter of Human Rights and Principles for the Internet. I'd like to tell a little anecdote as a backgrounder here. In 2005, I was in the UNESCO-organized conference, Freedom of Expression in the Cyberspace in Paris. At the end of this meeting, it was proposed to publish a joint statement, basically saying just that the Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights also applies in the cyberspace. That was rejected, because a representative of a government stated that this is way too radical for him to sign without a specific approval from his government. Now, against this background, when the IGF was started, quite a few people got the idea that it should be perfect forum for promoting human rights in the Internet and indeed making the human rights a very basis of Internet governance. And uh, after some hustling around with different coalitions, it the main one outcome of this was this our coalition of the Internet Rights and Principles. One of the longest surviving dynamic coalitions still going strong and one of the few to have actually produced something concrete. The idea was to produce a reference document to support human rights in the Internet. And within a surprisingly few short time, a few years, we managed to come up with something I think already is very useful in this. The Charter of Human Rights Principles in the Internet. It's intended to be to provide a recognizable framework anchored in international human rights as a shared reference point for dialogue and cooperation between different stakeholder groups and their priorities, an authoritative document for framing policy decisions and merging emerging rights-based norms for the online environment and a policy-making and advocacy tools for governments, businesses, and civil society groups alike in all levels of Internet governance. It has actually already accomplished a few of these goals. It has been referred to and used by a number of other documents, including several of the, about 25 similar Declaration of Principles that Chair mentioned in the beginning. Uh, the Charter has 21 clauses, which I will not read here. You will find them online. But we came up with a list of 10 broad principles that summarize what it's all about. Universality, accessibility, neutrality, freedom of expression, life, liberty, and security, privacy, diversity, standards and regulation, and governance. It is, of course, a live document still going to undergoing changes. Now we are in version 1.1, but it's still very much already a very useful, usable, complete document. Thank you. Thank you, Tapani. Uh, this was the Dynamic Coalition on Internet Rights and Principles where civil society plays a certain role, but it's not the only partner in civil society, but uh, the Association for Progressive Communication is a poorly civil society organization, and they have already adopted a set of principles, I think it was four or five years ago, Henriette. Can you give us a short overview about the status of your document? 
Um, thank you very much, Wolfgang. Um, the first APC Internet Rights Charter was released in 2001, and then we updated it in 2006 for the first IGF. And it has seven themes, um, Internet access for all, freedom of expression and association, access to knowledge, shared learning and creation, privacy surveillance and encryption, governance of the Internet, and awareness, protection, and realization of rights. Um, we have not updated this. Instead, we chose to collaborate with the IRP coalition um, in developing its um, charter. But we are now actually uh, starting a phase of, of working with it again. And, and I think that's partly a point that probably has been made already, and that for a community of people or organizations to work together, it can be a powerful tool to, to, to have their own um, um, set of principles. It doesn't mean that those principles can't overlap or, or have commonality with others. Um, just areas that we've been working in recently and that we are planning to work in is um, we've started working on more in-depth analysis of specific areas, such as freedom of association and um, freedom of expression. And the work that's been done by the human rights community is really enriching this at the Human Rights Council and the Human Rights Committee. And there are interpretive statements now available within the human rights framework on how these existing rights apply on the internet, which we can draw on. We've participated with others on principles uh, related to the application of human rights to communications surveillance. So um, with a group of civil society organizations, many who are here, um, there's now a set of principles called necessary and proportionate, which took in, goes into quite a lot of detail. Um, we are starting research now looking at economic, social, and cultural rights and looking at how these can be applied and what principles um, can be extracted. For example, we're going to look at the DNS system um, from a cultural diversity rights perspective. Um, and then I think the area that we're really excited about and we think uh, it's, it, it's, it's a collaboration that the IGF can really facilitate is looking at human rights and internet protocols. And in fact, a paper which has been co-written by Avery and Joy Lidicott um, looks at that because we believe that there is in these values of openness that have, have been so um, entrenched in, in internet development and that are really revered by the technical community, there's an opportunity for collaboration with the human rights community. And I think, I mean, so that's the work that we've been done. I just want to make a few remarks. I think, um, I think we are at a moment now when it is not necessary for people to abandon their own work on internet governance principles, but for the IGF to be a place where we come together and agree on certain core principles for internet governance. I think it's a way of um, measuring and recording our work. It will enhance the IGF status and influence, and it can also create a framework where we can come together and measure the extent to whether, we, you know, well, do those principles work and are people respecting them? I think behind that, a lot of detailed work needs to, to be done. I think, as Igor said, um, the specificity is actually quite important. Uh, we find that there's a lot of reference to human rights. Everyone mentions human rights. But you could have, uh, for example, the, the, the African Union Cybercrime Convention that's being developed now mentions human rights. But it also proposes criminalization of any blasphemous speech. So... There's a lot of complexity there, and I think we shouldn't pretend that just having a set of broadly agreed multi-stakeholder IGF principles is the end of the road. Um, there'll be discussion and there'll be debate, but I think that's positive. Um, so I look forward to this next phase of the IGF um, playing this role of, of establishing consensus, identifying divergence, and uh, facilitating debate. I think facilitating the debate is indeed, you know, the realistic objective for the next steps. 
So, but um, all this is underpinned by the technical infrastructure and the ISTAR organizations have formed now their own group. And I'm very happy that Lynn Senamur, the president of ISOC, is here. And so we, it would be good to get the perspective from the um, um, technical community. Lynn. Oh. Thank you, Wolfgang. Um, before I start, I would just like to say a strong plus one to, um, to Henriette's comments, which means just great support. Um, specifically, these principles were developed to address the standards activities. They are not a broad set of principles that the Internet organizations actually drives for um, all of our both policy and development activities. In fact, it came out of a discussion between the IEEE, the IETF, the IAB, and ISOC. Um, and it was basically to having recognized that there was a new paradigm for how standards were set in the world, wanting to document that. Um, that was obviously to show um, a new model in contrast to some of the more governmental models that exist. Um, specifically, the introduction says it was to establish a global community that stands together in support of modern paradigm for standards, which is an open collective movement to radically improve the way people around the globe develop, deploy, and embrace technologies for the benefit of humanity. There's five kind of... Um, I guess, usual categories for standards work. Um, the first one is cooperation, which basically just looks for respectful cooperation, um, specifically between standards organizations, each respecting the autonomy, integrity, processes, and intellectual property of the other organizations. The second principle is adherence to principles. Um, I, I won't go into them quickly. It's due process, broad consensus, transparency, balance, and openness. I think we're all fairly familiar with those specific comments. The third is on collective empowerment, which is actually um, looking for commitment by those standards organizations that affirm these principles to strive for standards that are chosen and defined based on technical merit as, as judged by the individual um, expertise of each participant, that they provide global interoperability, scalability, stability, resiliency, um, that they enable global competition, serve as building blocks for further innovation, and contribute to the creation of global communities. The fourth was availability, made accessible to all for implementation and deployment. And um, that is also where they address some of the intellectual property uh, terms as well. And the fifth was voluntary adoptions. Um, which is a really strong principle, that the standards are voluntarily adopted and success is determined by the market. Underlying a lot of these principles, of course, are a lot of the values that we hear about in a lot of the other statements with respect to human right and freedom of expression um, and that sort of thing. But given this was particularly focused on the standards world, they're not called out um, specifically at the top level. So, I mean, again, this wasn't meant to be the I-STAR organization's set of principles. It really was specifically to address uh, a standards paradigm. Um, and I think I was here probably to complete a tour de table. Thank you, Lynn. It was very helpful. And the, 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 let's say the final but not the less uh, the, uh, a very important stakeholders to private sector and the uh, private sector has established just um, a couple of years ago the Global Network Initiative, uh, and they came up also, you know, with a, that of principles. Max Senges, who is from Google Germany, is a partner of this Global Network Initiative. Max, can you give us a little bit the perspective of the private sector? Um, with pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you um, for inviting us, and good morning, everyone. Um, <clears throat> Let me um, start by making a slight differentiation between the different um, principles that we are talking about that I think is uh, important when we go into uh, um, thinking about consolidation and um, you know, coming up with a common theme, and that is that most of them are based in content on human rights, but then uh, we're talking in the title of this session about Internet governance principles. That means um, policy-making principles and then about principles that are um, more about the, the Internet itself and the functionality that it should have, so the aim of these principles. 
and um, the Global Network Initiative covers both of these, um, but has, as Wolfgang pointed out, a limited um, application. In this case, it's freedom of expression and privacy, and um, then processes that support um, accountability and good practice in that area in order to generate trust and a um, good climate for cooperation and um, multi-stakeholder governance. So um, <clears throat> when um, I go into the substance and the purpose of the um, Global Network Initiative. It is, in fact, to protect and advance freedom of expression and privacy in um, information and communication technologies. The um, actual contribution and innovation, I would say, that um, the GNI does is that um, it defines these principles and implementation guidelines for companies who receive government requests affecting free expression and privacy, but it then also backs them up with a set of um, independent assessment process that verifies companies are meeting these commitments. And then, of course, it is also a platform for um, interested stakeholders and participants to um, learn and engage in policy making. Now, um, when it comes to the content um, of the principles, I think um, multi-stakeholder governance is very important to the organization itself. It, uh, and the board includes all stakeholders um, but governments. In this particular case, as uh, Wolfgang pointed out, uh, it actually doesn't modify the um, goals and um, principles of uh, the Human Rights Declaration itself. It just says that freedom of expression and uh, the right to privacy should be enshrined in um, the online world as well, but then adds pieces about responsible company decision-making, which um, is, of course, important to generate the right mindset and um, cooperation in uh, the private sector community. It uh, encourages multi-stakeholder collaboration, not just enhanced cooperation, but um, collaboration, which um, I understand is one of the goals of this effort here to have um, different actors work together, collaborate. And then, of course, um, it's about governance, accountability, and transparency, all very uh, timely principles for um, taking this discussion forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Max. So here we have now eight different projects, four from government and four from non-governmental organizations, and the questions for the rest of the session is indeed, you know, what we're doing with this, you know, do we just move uh, or continue to move within our silos, or do we build bridges among the various uh, projects and groups? And so it's up to the floor now to make comments, to make proposals, you know, what we can do in the future. Though. And I have already, you know, uh, uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is uh, Rene Shen. I'm a um, member of the Chinese delegation rep uh, uh, representing uh, uh, the foreign ministry uh, of China. Um, I understand that we have interpretation, so I will make my statement in, in my mother tongue, which happens to be one of the six official languages of the <laughs> UN. Mr. President, thank you very much for the opportunity can you, can you wait for a moment because people have no um, headsets and the uh, transcript is, doesn't, doesn't work at this moment and so that means we cannot understand what you are saying. Um, uh, never mind. Probably the secretary can check, can you know, compromise. whether the transcript can continue, <laughs> that we can get the translation oh. on the screen. Oh, no, no, no. It's others, the, the earphones, I think. Okay. Thank you. Wolfgang. I, I apologize for any inconvenience <laughs> caused to you. But... Uh, 
No, you're, but you, this okay. is no, no uh, reason for um, an apology because, you know, we have a multilingual world, not only a multi-stakeholder world, a multilingual world. And yeah, yeah. My, my count is that the largest Internet population in the world comes from China. Okay. So that means you have a right to speak in Chinese, just to be very clear. So, but, uh, you know, on the other hand, we do not have the ability to understand it and we have to find a way that we get your message. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for... Uh, assuring me of my right <laughs> to speak in one of the uh, six official languages, <laughs> UN official languages. So I will continue to speak in Chinese. Thank you. Uh, 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 we remember, uh, 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 现在正在朝着向实质性的问题发展的这个发展的这个发展的这个发展的这个发展的这个发展的这个发展的这个发展的这个发展的这个发展的这个发展的这个发展的这个发展的这个发展的这个发展的这个发展的这个发展的这个发
，这个我我我我学到了。我们有世界人权宣言，我我了解到了啊。我们一九四八年制定的世界人权宣言，我们有一九六六六年通过的人权的两个 covenants， covenants 不是 governments， 然后我就了解到了解到了，我们的人权实际上是分为两类人权，一个是公民和政治权利，另一位另一类人权叫经济社会和文化权利。到了一九八六年的时候，联合国大会又通过了一个很重要的宣言，世界。呃，叫发展权宣言 （Declaration on the Right to Development）。这个当然，九三年还有维也纳的这个世界人权大会通过的，这个我们通过的这个呃这个这个呃行动纲领，呃，所以说我我我想我想说的有一条，就是说我们讨论这个人权的时候，我们一定要以一种平衡的。这个方法去讨论，我们不能够光侧重某一类的具体的人权，而忽视了其他的权利。那么，对于我们，我我来自一个发展中国家，对于来自发展中国家的人来说，我们非常关注的是权利，人权。谈到人权的时候，是我们的生存权利 （right to subsistence）， 我们的发展权利 （right to development）。到到互联网领域里头，我们发展中很多发展国家关注的是 right to access， 是接入权利。所以说我特别期待，希望我们大家把所有的跟这个人权，或者是说跟我们这个互联网这个发展有关的这个各个方面，我们都能够就是说讨论到。能够这样的在我们制定的这个原则里面呢，能够是一个非常平衡的这个呃一一条原则。当然，我们对这个呃这个我们已经开始讨论这个互联网治理的原则这个呃这个势头，我们非常高兴，我们愿意呃与与与各方一起共同努力，能够找到或者是制定出一条这个一套这个。非常这个呃公平的呃这个有有有长远的指导意义的互联网治理的原则。谢谢。I thank you very very much because the Chinese perspective is extremely important if we want really to have a globalized and multi-stakeholderized umbrella. A framework of commitment, or something like that. And what I see also from your intervention and the previous interventions is that we see, regardless of the differences, we have some groups of principles.、Uh, one is related to the social economic rights development, what you said. Others are more to the civil political rights. Others to the technical functioning of the internet. Others to the economic dimension. So what I see from the discussion so far that. Some baskets are emerging, you know, which some very individual issues belonging to the basket, and this could help us to move forward so that we have a structure, and then we can work, you know, within the various baskets to find out, you know, where we have the consensus among the 193 governments and among the governments, the private sector, the civil society, and the Technical community. This is a tremendous challenge to do this, but I think the ITF is the only platform in the world who provides a space that we can have such a discussion.、Uh, the General Assembly of the United Nations has not this multi-stakeholder model, but the ITF has it, and so far the ITF is the much better place to do it, and the only place. And I'm very happy that I have identified now a person from Brazil. Carlos Afonso, who is a member of the CGIBBR、uh, Steering Committee, and that he can give us just a very brief overview about the status of the ten principles,、uh, the famous ten principles from Brazil. Carlos.
Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I am one, uh, a member of the CGI.br representing civil society organizations, and uh, I, I am, am one of the two early drafters of the principles, but I don't have the 10 principles in my head in detail. I know what they mean, I know what they are, but I can't quote to you all the 10 precisely but I know all of them. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what was this process, which I think is the most important thing in a pluralist or a pluriparticipative environment? Uh, you know that CGI.pr, since 2003, has uh, its non-governmental members elected by their, by their own interest groups. Private sector elects their, their their members, civil society elects their members, and the technical academic sector also elects their members. You do have the principles here, great, thank you. Uh, and uh, we started the idea of the 10 principles uh, for two reasons. The first was especially to orient us, CGI.br, in our work as a sort of reference regarding the development of the internet in the country. And we were being called by several sectors and instances, nationally and internationally, to talk about what we thought regarding certain proposals, especially several bills of law that circulate in Congress, and uh, which some of them are really amazing. You know, as people that never heard about the internet are proposing bills of law still today that uh, are simply impossible. And uh, the idea was to sort of have a booklet of orientation regarding things that you should take into account before proposing anything regarding rules, regulations, or laws which would affect either the network itself or the internet as a whole. So we started this at the beginning of 2007 the discussion, and the idea was to have the proposal approved by consensus, not voting, to make sure that all sectors agreed to it. And this took us two years of uh, going back and forth. Uh, the principles were born as 15 principles, and we tried to reduce them. They became seven, and then 12, and finally we managed to have the 10 principles, which you know quite well because they are available uh, in several several places. Um, and then we managed to have the signature of the representatives of the private sector especially, because of one of the delicate topics is net neutrality, which is the topic which uh, the president in, in the United Nations expressed exactly as it is in principle number six. And uh, the uh, transnational corporations which operate the telecommunication service in Brazil do not, uh, did not want that principle to uh, be used in the civil framework for the internet that been, has been proposed as a bill of law because it affects their business models and uh, they don't want it to, to, to be, uh, say, interfering with that. This Marco Civil, uh, sorry, this uh, list of principles from CGIBR was the seed for the Marco Civil proposal, the framework for civil rights. And this process of building the civil right, uh, the civil framework uh, proposal it started in, at the end of 2009 on the basis of these 10 principles. It was more than a public consultation, was a public debate in a, in, a, in a portal called e-democracy in which we were able, every sector, every individual that wanted to have uh, his or her opinion expressed uh, could, uh, could uh, put their opinion on, on those, uh, the, the details of the civil rights framework. And this was built until 2011, so it took at least two years to be built. And finally, at the end of 2012, we managed to get it into Congress as a, con as a consensus of society. That was the way it was built. And uh, now it's going through Congress. 
And in Congress, of course, those interests of the telcos, of the big media, are represented and are lobbying heavily to change certain aspects of the civil rights framework to their interests. One of them is net neutrality. The other is the uh, accountability of intermediaries, which is very serious, you know, and uh, respect for privacy. And uh, the, especially the big media is campaigning to make sure that are, they are able to take down sites which host uh, what they say is uh, a violation of uh, intellectual property rights without the dual, a dual legal process. They want an exception when the case of, is of violation of intellectual property rights. And we, of course, don't want that. This is not in the should not be in the civil rights framework. And the president herself said that she doesn't want that either. So these are the, 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 the civil rights is going through Congress now in a process which is a fast track process. It should in a few weeks be decided by Congress. And we are very afraid, very concerned that the pressure of these big lobbies might change certain aspects of the civil rights framework and uh, especially these three points that I have mentioned. So uh, we are you know, saying that this is, is a very important victory for Brazil to have this multi-stakeholder structure operating within Brazil and uh, since 1995, especially since 2003. And we are saying that we, we would like very much for other countries to consider similar structures in the, in the governance of the internet within their countries and, uh, and uh, we would like to show to the world a civil rights framework according to the wishes by consensus of the citizenship of Brazil. We are not sure we'll be able to do that. In a few weeks, we'll know. But we hope we'll be able to do it. This is it, basically. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. And I think this is a wonderful example that it shows that the multi-stakeholder process is a very complicated one. This is really not easy. But if you have the goodwill from all sides, it's possible to do it because all parties, the government, the private sector, civil society, the technical community, have some common interest that the internet works, that's free, that's open. So this is the general framework where regardless of all the differences and the specifics which, you know, produced in the fight among various groups, um, you know, can be put for the side for a moment and we agree on, on, on common principles so that we can have something like a reference where everybody say, okay, this is our home within the framework. But in a home, we all know this, you have also conflicts. So that means if we are moving towards consensus, this does not mean we want to have a conflict-free world. So the world will be full of conflicts. But it's very helpful if you have such a framework, a guideline, where you have an orientation and can say, you know, this is where all sides commit. And what Carlos has just said, they try to avoid voting and are looking for consensus. This makes it indeed more complicated but more sustainable. So that means the multi-stakeholder process is more complex than a one-stakeholder process. We should be aware of this. But the quality of the outcome of the multi-stakeholder process is much higher than the outcome of a one-stakeholder process. So we have around 20 minutes left. So, um, you know, we will use the rest of the time to discuss, you know, how to move forward and what we can do now from after Bali, uh, going to the next IGF or going to the Brazil meeting and the next IGF, the Visis 10 Plus, probably in Sochi or uh, somewhere else. So, and, and please, you know, I have one, two, three, four, five. Oh, okay. okay. Be, sorry? Okay, and also remote participation. Be, be uh, very brief. I think the first speaker was there. Okay, and, and, and please be very brief. Uh, thank you, Wolfgang. This is just a marvelous exercise in uh, comparing the various principles that have been uh, worked on around the world. I am Olga Madruga Forti from the ICANN uh, board, but just as a, as a platform for how to progress 
the dialogue at a more homogeneous international level, given all these individual exercises. My first question to any member of the panel is, is there any doubt that Articles 19 and 20 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights apply to the Internet uh, space? And if the answer to that is that there is no doubt, then really what areas beyond that should we be concentrating on that require uh, any further development? Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Okay. Introduce yourself. Thank you. We need a microphone. Probably in the meantime, uh, Paul, are there some questions from remote participants? Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, okay. My name is Eddie Toib. I am from Indonesian ICT Society. Actually, I am a little bit new in this um, uh, discussion because this is my first time to join the IGF conference. But when I listened from yesterday, when we are talking about the Internet principles, uh, what I can see from um, various conversations, from the various um, presentation that uh, I can I can find that actually there is no sharp difference bef between the one and the two another uh, concepts as, as for instance when I look into the what uh, OECD has you know we um, for instance um, OECD is stressing into the access to knowledge uh, free digital culture privacy and freedom of expression open standard decent works and uh, with the um, while, while um, at the presentation focusing on democracy and freedom of speech. I think um, from my perspective of view, when we go into the, the common understanding, the common principle, there is no difference between one another. Uh, why don't we um, agree, um, you know, that we stop into, this, uh, into the general uh, um, understanding, not go to details. And when we go to the details, let it to the um, respective, respective countries. Uh, for instance, you know, when we are talking about the freedom of exp expression, freedom of speech, um, maybe for the European um, countries, as, uh, US, pro uh, for instance, it will be different with uh, freedom of speech here in Indonesia, in China, and maybe also in India. I think when we go to details, we, we cannot find the, um, the um, what is it, the uh, common understanding. So we stop not, not to go to details. That is what, what I am thinking, actually. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Paul, do we have any remote questions? Yes, um, there are remote participants from Mexico and Nigeria, and there are many questions also circulating on Twitter. I think we can summarize them in two blocks. Um, the first question block is, is there a number of how many principles do actually exist, and how is it possible for all stakeholders, especially governments, to adopt and respect all those different principles? And um, the second question is more related to the interpretation, implementation. So how is it possible to, um, to implement and interpret those principles? How does this articulate? Okay, so I, I give this question to the final round when, we, when I ask the all panelists you know, to make a final statement. Let's take three or four more questions now from the floor. Okay, one, two, three, no, but there are three. Thank you, Chair. Um, my name is Subhi Chaturvedi, and I teach communication and new media technology in a university, Women's College in India. Um, there are a lot of questions that we ask and we pose. I think it's a fantastic exercise, and thank you for differentiating between Internet principles and Internet governance principles. I think that is a very important distinction that we need to make. Um, it is an important concern and a question from the Indian perspective because we know that the Internet is something that governments increasingly are adopting and adapting themselves to. It's been a slow learning curve. For us, it is extremely important and crucial because when we make new laws and when we make new policies and when we talk about upholding human rights, a lot of times vulnerable communities and marginalized communities get to bear the brunt of backhand regulation because they're the ones who are being cherished and protected. Um, there are two young girls who've just 
gone to jail because they have dated their Facebook status. And these are important concerns because this was a law that was going to help the society protect them from spam. Now, in terms of policy and in terms of acting principles, is there some way I want to reiterate the importance of consultation because this is public policy for public good. Can we re-emphasize that in the principles? And I want to also echo the question that there are many principles. Can we come together for a consensus to about 10 broad-based agreed principles that countries across the world and governments across the world, even with different needs from democracies and emerging countries and economies, can agree to and correspond with? This is exactly the point we want to achieve with this session, so that we, the outcome in 10 minutes will be that we have a recommendation that the various groups should look for such a broad-based um, Ten principle document or whatever. Um, you know, we are under pressure of time now, so that means we have two more interventions. Uh, this is the last intervention, and then we go back to the uh, uh, panelists for the final comment. Thank you for giving them the floor. Uh, I'm uh, Leana Galistian from Armenia, ISOC Armenia, and uh, I would like to um, represent uh, the principles uh, which Armenia exercise uh, and wants to exercise uh, regarding IGF. Um, and uh, I want to say that uh, Armenia is a country of challenges in the development of telecommunication and IT, yet it has a success story of collaboration of the government with the private and public sector. And uh, yeah, Armenia uh, once um, um, started a process of uh, establishing a permanent uh, national IGF body, um, implementing a multi-stakeholder model with involvement of NGOs, private sectors, and with minimal involvement of government. Uh, this is plan planned to be implemented in 2014. Uh, according to the initial plan, the secret uh, secretariat for this body will be the ISOC Armenia, which works on transparent and uh, public basis. And uh, to, to say the principle, uh, in short, are as follows. Providing people with internet access uh, to create favorable conditions to register domain names in AM zone as well as support local hosting, uh, support distribution of IPv6 and DNSSEC, human rights in uh, internet, privacy protection and identification, uh, diversity traffic routing, security and network neutrality. Uh, these are the principles which were uh, discussed uh, in uh, this table, and many countries support these principles. Um, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. And um, Norbert? Norbert Bolo, I'm with the Swiss Open Systems User Group. I wanted to quickly address this idea and need of consolidating the various statements of principles, and it appeared to me that this focus on the right to development that had been suggested might actually help with that because that is sort of a cross-cutting concern. It's not uh, something that can be put into any basket, but we could look at all those sets of principles and said, what do we need to actually achieve sustainable development? What do we need to make the Internet help us achieve that goal? Thank you. Thank you very much, and sustainable development is the main theme for this ITF. Uh, you have the final question, and then we'll go back to the panel. So, Negitu Ekbe from Nigeria, but I speak for myself. I have two questions. What would be the implication when all nations do not ratify the core Internet uh, principles? Because currently, you notice that the human rights violation occurs in many nations, and nothing has been happening to such nations from the UN. My second question, with my understanding of multi-stakeholder, what platform shall we use to have participatory democracy and elect representations? Thank you. Thank you. Very big questions, and so it will take another IGF to answer all this. 
questions in detail, but you know, one thing is for sure that the IGF offers this multi-stakeholder platform, and if you bring it down to the national level and create national platforms like in Brazil, like now in Armenia, uh, in Germany we have also started to create a uh, multi-stakeholder internet governance platform at home. And as Markus Kummer always said, you know, good internet governance starts at home. So it means to start on the national level is very useful, and to use the multi-stakeholder model, which you we, we, we exercise here in the IGF and bring it back home. I think this is a good idea. So my final question now to the panelists is, okay, what we have seen is the broad variety of different principles, different instruments, different stakeholders who, you know, have expressed their wish and have translated into realities a set of principles. Um, there was a wish, on the other hand, now to... Uh, bring this into a, a main set of principles, which is universal, globalized, multi-stakeholder. And my questions to the uh, original panelists is, what would be the uh, readiness or the approach of your organization? Uh, would you think this is a good way forward to undertake the effort to come together under the umbrella of the IGF or linked to the IGF, probably using the platform of the Dynamic Coalition uh, and to try to globalize and multi-stakeholderize the set of principles. And I start with Anne, and it's Anne Karblank, not Karblank, so there was a misspelling of her name on the, um, on the nameplate and also here on the transcript. So, Anne, um, what are OECD uh, things? Are you ready to move forward? Thank you, Wolfgang, not only for um, putting my name right, Carre Blanc, <laughs> but also for reminding everybody that I'm speaking for the OECD. Um, yes, uh, we last year when IGF took place in, in Baku, uh, there was already the beginning of a discussion, and um, the OECD secretary had seen merits in trying to come together with um, a set of common principles, I've heard all the very interesting interventions around the table, and I believe that the different approaches that have been presented could certainly be taken into account. You mentioned yourself a few of the common areas, and the intervention by the Chinese uh, representative was very useful, I think, also to further characterize what are the groups of the principles that could be uh, um, examined. So, yes, we would like to contribute. Thank you very much. Lee, Council of Europe. Thank you, Wolfgang. Um, a, a simple yes. Um, we have a mandate from the, our Internet Governance Strategy, which was adopted by uh, the member states, the 47 member states, to develop a framework of understanding and commitments based on core values and principles of Internet Governance to protect the Internet's universality, integrity and openness as a means of safeguarding freedom of expression, uh, regardless of frontiers and Internet freedom. So we have a, a mandate to do that, and, and the governments are supporting that, 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 that process. I mean, they, when they were adopted in, in an intergovernmental setting, the, the member states, they affirmed it, they, 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 they declared their commitment to, to that in their national and international policy, and they encouraged other actors to be involved in that process. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big yes, uh, and we already do that, actually, in, in our own work. We, we, we're unfolding uh, the Internet governance principles into our other standards and our normative work. Okay, thank you, Lee. We're running out of time, so my question goes now directly to the others, and the question is only yes or no. Would you jump into the boat, Igor? Um, would um, you, the Russian government, would it jump into the boat and to participate in the process towards the multi stakeholderization and globalization of Internet principles? Um, we fully support the idea of uh, globalization of these principles, and uh, I, I really believe that uh, the Tunis agenda and uh, the development um, made within uh, main international organizations uh, is uh, really important. Um, and all the efforts need to be kind of 
coordinated. And uh, I believe the IGF is really multi stakeholding uh, uh, organization. Uh, we could Im implement some mechanisms uh, which uh, allow the IGF to produce uh, the high level uh, principles. And also, I stress on, on the um, Uh, there is a uh, usual question, in, um, can we apply the regulation uh, existing uh, for offline economy, offline, offline society to online, uh, uh, to internet economy? Yeah. And uh, I think uh, there is a third answer. Y yes, no, it's usual approach, but uh, internet already changed the governance, okay. uh, or already changed the regulation. And uh, so uh, we're in, in this process. Uh, and the best practices also is very important and we should exchange it. Thank you very much. And I heard already from um, APC, civil society, your answer is yes? Um, I think the answer is yes, but I think there are risks as well. I think um, if the principles we come up with are just lowest common denominator principles, it won't be good enough. And I do think common principles are good, and then we can debate differences in implementation. There's just one more risk, sorry, um, and that is that we agree on principles like privacy, for example, and then there's blatant disregard by states and by governments of those principles with no accountability, and then that could also undermine this. So I think, yes, we should do it, but with a serious commitment to account and measure and debate. Lynn, technical community. Yes, but. Yes to moving forward and a strong yes to doing it within the IGF. And I'd actually like to see some straw frameworks put out in a global process that would allow some quick kind of refinements so we can actually move forward more concretely with the work. Thank you very much. Max, GNI, yes? Well, the GNI um, has a very, um, kind of different and more specialized purpose. And I think um, currently the organization is uh, aiming to internationalize the network and to expand across different ICT sectors. So as far as um, uh, I can speak for that organization, I think we're interested to uh, participate and learn and contribute. I'm not sure um, whether we can sign an agreement like that. It's not the moment for signing an agreement. It's to Obviously, start the process. To participate so, in the discussion. Yes. And Tapani, would the Dynamic Coalition ready to facilitate the process to be to give them um, uh, institutional background and framework? Uh, yes, for yes for the first question and yes for the second. I think the easiest, light, most lightweight way to move forward is simply set up a new mailing list for discussion. And I'm, I think I can promise it on behalf of the coalition we can offer that much. Okay, thank you very much. I think it's a clear message to our rapporteur just to summarize you know, the conclusions from this so that we have a concrete outcome. We need more outcomes from the IGF, and I think this 90 minutes have produced an outcome. I'm very sorry for the next uh, focus session that we have stolen five minutes, and I hand it over to our chairman to close the session. Thank you very much. Okay, now we come to the end of this session. Several issues have been discussed. Uh, I feel the atmosphere that we can embrace the spirit of Internet governance uh, principles, but still uh, many questions remain unanswered, uh, especially uh, how we're going to impl implement these uh, guiding principles to uh, each country. Uh, allow me, as a chairman of these sessions, you know, uh, I come from Indonesia, Indonesia is so diverse. Uh, it is an archipelagic uh, country with 17,000 islands, 450 ethnics. It's not easy to implement uh, in such things uh, what we call uh, uh, universal uh, principles because one another is uh, so diverse, so different. Uh, so as uh, one of my colleagues uh, mentioned uh, today, that uh, we have also to... Uh, consider to look for uh, how the social life, cultural life of uh, each country, of each ethnic in uh, each country. So again, uh, I thank you the moderators and all the experts that participate in these uh, uh, sessions. Uh, 
with these comments, I conclude the session in critical internet resources uh, in government, uh, sorry, in internet governance principles. I thank our moderators and participants for the available discussion. I call the session closed and pass the microphone to Masengo in the IGF Secretariat. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we will immediately move into the next session. So if the moderators and others would join. Um, the chairman of the session I do not see here. At